Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being the brave attendees for our first Digest This program, which is a collaboration with SITE, the Institute for Applied Ecology, and 315 Restaurant and Wine Bar. So all of us are teaming together to bring something completely new to all of you. Um, SITE's Digest This series usually happens in the museum and usually um, relates to the theme of the exhibition that's on view. And I was originally gonna go completely rogue. Um, by the way, I'm Joanne Lefrac. I'm SITE's Director of Education and um, Curator of Public Practice. Um, so I was gonna go completely rogue and come up with something uh, completely different than what we have on view in the museum because we weren't open to the public. But just two weeks ago, we were allowed to be open to the public. And the theme of the exhibition is displacement. Um, so please reserve a time to come and check out the exhibition at site. It's just timed entry so that we can be very safe and healthy and clean in the museum and you can feel safe to see the exhibition. And so the theme of the Digest This programs, which will happen during the month of September, also will be on displacement. And um, first, I want to thank the New Mexico Humanities Council for sponsoring this program and going with us when we had no idea how we were going to present public programming during this time. And so we're thrilled that the Humanities Council is still willing to try out new things with all of us. So um, the Digest This series will be displaced on restaurant patios so that we can be outdoors and in a safe environment. And thanks so much to Lewis Moscow for being willing to be the first and to be willing, being willing to try anything new. When I propose something to him, he tends to be game for it. So we're lucky that he's one of the best chefs in town, if not the best chef in town, and uh, is willing to try new things with us too. So the Institute for Applied Ecology um, was originally gonna be part of the Digest This series um, related to the theme of displacement. And so they also were willing to just try something new and to do it here as well. And so the idea of displacement, we're talking about invasive species. So um, they'll talk more about how that relates to displacement in their, in their presentation. But first, um, Louis Moscow um, is going to be giving us a demonstration, a cooking demonstration live. Thanks so much to all the people who are viewing this presentation um, on our live stream. This is also new for us. We are live streaming in a live environment for the first time. And so this is also really exciting. So, um, so the idea be behind edible invasive species is that um, you can at home um, here in New Mexico or wherever you live forage for your own species and cook them. And um, so when I proposed this to Lewis, he said, what kinds of in invasive species are here? Melanie um, Giesler from the Institute for Applied Ecology gave us a list and Lewis was willing to go for it. So, um, so thank you, Lewis Moscow and 315 Restaurant for being here. And thanks to all of you in our live audience and those of you who are live streaming at home. So take it away, Lewis. All right. Um, thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. Um, anything that I can do that connects me further with what I'm doing, what I'm cooking, what I'm serving to my customers and myself is a really good thing for me. I'm like really into this. I'm really uh, dedicated to doing this on so many levels. Um, I'm going to start by cooking these frog legs uh, that were not harvested by us. Um, but uh, just so you can get an idea of how to cook them and what the experience is like, you, um, you've probably heard that they taste like chicken, when in fact, they don't. They taste more like soul to me. I think what people are probably referring to is just the muscular structure of them, which is similar to what you'd get from chicken because it's a leg, like many legs, has a thigh and a, a calf. So we're gonna season these with some salt and pepper. They're actually really a delicate flavor, so I don't like to do too much to them. 
Um, I've got a hot pan over here. I'm gonna simply dredge these in flour. I'm gonna put some oil in the pan. And then I'm gonna sear them. So I really refrain from putting too much additional seasoning on these things because they are so special and delicate. Okay, some other components we have for this dish. Um, we have a lobster sauce here that um, I have some crayfish tails in, which are another uh, invasive species that I've been encouraged to use for this demonstration. And really trying to use as many invasive species as we can. Um, we also have some dandelion greens here, which are also invasive. And then I did shop at the farmer's market today. So we've got some nice ratatouille and mashed potatoes, which are, of course, not invasive. Um, so we got this going under a, a fairly good heat. So I did get to go gigging for frogs. I'll add you that uh, we did it at night. And it was a really interesting experience. Um, the necessary tool looks a lot like this my new friend uh, that I now sleep with under my bed. It has a lot of persuasive uh, ability. Um, so anyway, just getting uh, a little closer to experiencing the ingredient and how it's harvested. It was done late at night. Uh, we walked through like a fairly flooded um, estuary, I would call it, that was full of mosquitoes and bats and it was kind of a treacherous experience. Um, the, um, you, you need obviously a really high powered flashlight to find them. And then they kind of just uh, allow you to get up on them. And um, I gotta say after um, impaling a few of them, they, they don't die very easily. So the harvesting is definitely a challenge. And all of the factors of the fact that it's dark out and you're in water and there's a lot of other things going on and then getting them actually into the bag and staying in the bag was also a, another challenge so um as the tails uh, or the legs start to brown i'm just going to flip them over and you can see that the um oh you probably can't see but the muscles start to pull away into little segments it's kind of important to cook them all the way. If they don't cook all the way, there's sort of a, a toughness that sort of remains to the frog legs. So I really like to cook them all the way through. And that meat gets really tender. I also like to baste them with butter and garlic. Garlic is a really, um, it, it's an exceptional flavor for something that's so delicate. Um, as these frog legs are. So what I'll do is instead of chopping my garlic and overpowering it, I'll just throw some whole cloves in there. And then I add some butter. And the butter allows me to baste the garlic aromatized um, butter over the legs. So I'll normally I would do this away from me but I'll do it towards me so you can see. And so this is the French technique called poilé. Okay, so we're basting these legs to get them to cook all the way through, all the way down to the bone. The interesting thing about these frog leg bones is they're really hard. They're much harder than say a bird bone. So the meat will pull off of it really nicely when they're done. All right, so just let them carry through a little bit. I'm gonna start to um, plate this dish. We're gonna use a little mashed potatoes. We're gonna put this into a ring mold just to keep the presentation clean. And then I've got my farmer's market 
ratatouille. I'm going to layer on top. And my frog legs look like they're almost there. I do like to err on the side of caution and really let them cook all the way through. I find it's even kind of hard to actually cook them all the way to, whoa, to overcook them. All right, I do have some dandelion greens here that I'm gonna just sweat down in this aromatized butter. Move the garlic. And these will cook really quick. They have an inherent bitterness to them that cooks out pretty quickly. All right. Season everything. Assemble our legs. And then finally, our crayfish sauce. These are just crayfish tails. I think the delicate nature of the frog legs really takes well to a nice sauce. Of course, this is a French restaurant. We do everything with sauce. All right, a little wipe on the plate. And there you have it, our invasive species. I feel like we've cooked the invasive properties out of them and now they're ready to be enjoyed. Cheers. Thank you so much, Lewis, for giving us this demo and um, for, again, uh, being willing to try new things with us at Site Santa Fe. And um, uh, pretty soon, all of you guys will get to sample uh, this dish. Um, so are there any questions from either the live or live stream audience at this time? Okay, well, we will um, also have a moment for questions um, after the uh, Melanie and Jason uh, present. And so um, I am happy, very happy to introduce Melanie Giesler and Jason Roback. Melanie is the Southwest Director of the Institute for Applied Ecology and a contributor to uh, this cookbook. Um, that all of you who are live have on your um, plates, uh, um, on your tables here, um, called They're Cooked, um, which is a cookbook uh, for um, invasive species. Um, they've given me this incredible um, apron here from uh, their invasive species cook-off. Um, and I love their uh, phrase that goes along with their invasive species cook-off, which is eradication by mastication. Um, that's lovely. So, um, <laughs> so Jason uh, will be presenting with Melanie and Jason is our field biologist. Um, he is the master at collecting invasive species with his bare hands. Um, he did not use one of the, the gigs that uh, Lewis showed off. He just grabbed them with his hands. Um, he's also an educator. He's been an educator for 20 years, um, being a uh, a director of education, all educators are um, such incredible people. We're so grateful for educators. Um, he 
teaches down in Albuquerque and um, teaches biology and environmental science. Um, thank you for continuing to do so in this time of social distancing. Um, we all owe some gratitude to all of our educators, especially at this time. So thank you, Melanie and Jason, for teaching us all about edible invasive species. Thank you so much, Joanne. Sorry, this is loud. <laughs> well, first of all, I also want to extend our gratitude to Site Santa Fe for hosting this great event and, and Joanne for all her efforts to make this happen. Um, also really grateful to um, the 315 Chef Lewis for doing this hosting and making this amazing meal for us all. Um, so as Joanne mentioned, I'm with the Institute one, huh? for Applied Ecology. Um, we have an office in Corvallis, Oregon, but we also have one right here in Santa Fe. Sweet. And um, I'm here today yeah, with Jason, too, as Joanne mentioned. Sugar, and Jason salt. and I actually go way back, like 25 years. <laughs> and um, we, um, yeah, did you want to say anything about that? Oh, sure, sure. Um, hello. So uh, Mel and I both went to UNM um, and got our biology degrees from there. And we had this uh, really amazing class together called, what was the title of this class? Intertidal Invertebrate Zoology. And we got to spend uh, seven days on the beach in Puerto Penasco doing research on intertidal invertebrates. And that's where we met. And then of course went our separate ways in about uh, five years ago. Um, I was, I'm part of the Native Plant Society of New Mexico and I was uh, uh, attending one of the lectures they were giving at the museum in Albuquerque and then the presenter looked very familiar to me <laughs> and it turned out it was Melanie and we reconnected from there and I talked to her about um, trying to get some of my students to do projects with her with the Institute of Applied Ecology and we've been kind of doing that back and forth for the last few years and so we've been uh, wanting to bring this program from Oregon down to New Mexico for a while so we finally made it happen. Be happy about that. Right, and so um, I also just want to uh, reiterate what Joanne said about that how lobster sauce to have is someone killer, man. like Jason, who's both a teacher and a, an amazing naturalist here today. Um, and so, why are we here today? Well, obviously, we're all interested in eating invasive species, um, but we're also um, we're, we're very interested in opening up a whole new world to you about different invasive species that you can eat that are in your own backyard. Um, very interesting foods out there. And so anytime you, uh, you know, look around and you'll see some of these familiar plants, there's a few plants on your table, you might think, well, maybe I could eat that plant. Um, yeah, so um, the other thing is that we're really hoping to raise awareness about invasive species and some of the threats that they pose. Um, and so this picture here, um, well, there's a handout for all of you here at the restaurant, um, and uh, I believe you're following online, um, that has the slides that I'm referring to. And so um, there's a picture there with some blackberry, a blackberry Penna cotta, and it just goes to show you that invasive species can be um, beautiful, delicious, and and we'll, we hope you see that they're also nutritious. Hey guys, are we ready to start cooking this food to put it out? Yeah. Let's rock it out. Um, there, it looks so the like Institute there's 10, for Applied Ecology I think there's um, 10, I'd has been at least 11. Uh, I'll do another hosting count, but... invasive species cook-offs and doing wild harvesting of invasive species since 2012. And as Joanne mentioned, we jokingly refer to it as eradication by mastication. And this is actually um, the first year ever that um, we'll be doing it with our, Santa, our Southwest office here in Santa Fe. Um, Also, there is a cookbook on your table that uh, there are several species I'll be mentioning today that there are actually recipes for in that cookbook. So please follow along. So 
So let's face it, invasive species are just brilliantly successful. Um, they can tolerate a wide range of conditions. Um, in the case of plants, they can shade out their competitors. They can send their roots deep and use up all the water. Uh, and also, usually when invasive species are introduced, their natural predators do not come with them. And so there's nothing keeping them in check. And another very uh, good characteristic for invasive species is that they produce a lot of offspring. And if you look at your handout, um, there's a picture of Siberian elm. Siberian elm is actually um, found all over Santa Fe, especially along the arroyos. And um, do you want to point to it, Jason? It's this guy. And uh, I took these pictures uh, just in my neighborhood. Uh, the photo on the left, uh, all those little tan bits in the grass, those are the seeds of Siberian elm from one tree. And the picture on the right, it looks like a bunch of green leaves. Well, those are actually all of the seeds. And um, the seeds are apparently edible, and Jason's going to tell you about that. Sure. Yeah, if you have these in your neighborhood, which almost assuredly you have them in your neighborhood because they're everywhere um, in the spring, they're one of the first things to kind of seed out and they get all over everything. You've had to sweep them. I've been behind cars on the highway, like uh, open bed pickups, and you can just see the seeds just dispersing <laughs> as they dry, which is probably the best thing that ever happened to these plants. But when they're still green, um, you really can just pick them right off the tree and just eat them raw. And they're not bad. Um, they're not, I, I, it's hard to describe the flavor. They're very mild flavor. They're not bitter, they're not overpowering, but it's just, I mean, there's metric tons of them out there. And it's, it's amazing for about two, three weeks in the spring, just walk down the street and you can grab them off um, from anywhere. And uh, the more you eat, the less of them there are available to spread the species, right? I mean, as you can see, there's one growing right here. They tend to grow up in places that uh, don't get a lot of attention, like up through other plants in your neighborhood backyards, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. So any, any little bit you can eat is gonna help out the natives to have that much better chance of, of, of competing against them. So good job invasive species here. You're doing a great job out there, but the problem is that they take over and they can form like the native, the plants can form monocultures like this thistle. And um, when that happens, we lose diversity, um, we lose other species, and, and that's a big problem. Um, and invasive species are masters of displacement, so it is a perfect theme for this event. Um, and in addition to that, they not only threaten the ecology, but they also are pretty devastating to the economy. Uh, this is a pretty old statistic. Uh, that I found from about five years ago, um, stating that invasive species cost the United States over $120 billion a year. So the picture that you see is a uh, musk thistle, and it is edible. I've heard it tastes like artichoke. Oh, the poker game. So, um, a lot of people, most people are not familiar about uh, what species are native or not. And then most people don't understand why they're a problem. They just have a nice pretty tree in their yard that gives them lots of shade and they don't have to water. And for most people, that, that's what they're looking for in a tree in their yard. It's big, it's green, it's pretty. Why would I have a problem with it? Um, at my school, we're lucky enough to have an outdoor environmental area with the pond and everything. We've had um, bullfrogs, which you guys will be tasting pretty soon. And um, they're, they're very cute. They're adorable frogs, look like Kermit. And then some of my students, when I tell them that I hunt them, are, are horrified by it. How could you do that? They're so adorable, right? So the analogy I, I try to tell them to get them to understand why they're a problem is if you think of, think of a native ecosystem, all the species in a native ecosystem uh, playing a card game together. Like they're all sitting together to play poker. There's hundreds of, hundreds of participants at this table, right? And they've all been playing with each other for tens of thousands of years, okay? So meaning in that time, they've learned each other's tricks. They learn how to read each other's faces, right? Uh, every once in a while, one gets ahead and then it goes back down, right? So there's a, there's a balance. They know each other. They know all their tricks and, and everything that goes on, right? Um, and then one day, here comes a new player. They don't know this guy at all. He's got cards they've never seen, right? 
And so he's got an unfair advantage because he's coming from some other card game across the world, right? He shows up. And then what happens a lot is that they just, they don't know how to compete with them. Um, the guys have an unfair advantage. They're gonna clean out some of the native species and they're gonna be gone, right? And so that's the problem. And, you know, and yes, there will be a balance again in maybe who knows how long, half a million years or so, they'll find a balance with this new species. But in the meantime, we could lose dozens of natives, right? And these card players have enough problems to deal with. They've got, you know, climate change, the room's getting hotter. Um, the water they're drinking has pollutants in it now from us. Um, the room they're playing in is getting smaller and smaller because of encroachment from humans. So they have all this stress to deal with as it is. And then they have these card sharks come in, so to speak. And, and yeah, it, it's, we lose a lot of native species. And, you know, New Mexico species just have New Mexico to live in. So that's, that's, the, that's what's so tough about it. So yes, it's not that the bullfrogs are evil or Russian olives are out to get the native species. It's just that they throw that balance out. And um, we as humans being aware of that should do our part to kind of maintain that balance as best we can. As an ecologist, uh, one of the things we like to do is uh, conserve biodiversity. And also we're trying to support ecosystem health. And so we do need to uh, control invasive species. And there are some invasive species out there that make that really difficult. And one of them is the invasive American bullfrog. And um, we've made a, an effort at working on that just a couple weekends ago. Um, but this invasive species is now gonna be a star on your dinner plates. And in a little while after the program, will be a star in a film. So stay tuned. All right, so the main problem with bullfrogs, uh, they are native to the country, uh, but they're not native to New Mexico. So they're native to the south, the southeast of Louisiana and that area. But, and they were brought here. No one knows exactly how um, probably uh, or possibly as bait. Um, it's hard to tell. They could have be escaped pets. Um, I can tell you in the instance of my school, again, we have this wetland. And uh, the story that I heard, because they were there when I started at the school, was that an uh, elementary school teacher in the neighborhood had some as pets. She was retiring. She didn't know what to do with them. And she thought probably with the best of intentions, oh, you know, Sandia High School has this pond. I bet they love it in there. And then she put him in there. And then 20 years later, still fighting. Them. <laughs> There's one left, uh, I think, but I'm trying to get him. But when I started there, I noticed that there was just, just a plethora of bullfrogs and very little else. Uh, you would think a wetland, you'd see dragonflies, you'd hear all sorts of other frogs calling. And I'd see a dragonfly once a week or something and no other native um, amphibians or reptiles to speak of at all. As I started to try to take control of them, I started to notice that we got more dragonflies, five, six, seven, eight species of them. We've been trying to bring in native leopard frogs and the native woodhouse toads. And uh, it's, it's, it's amazing the difference it makes when you start to get rid of them. That picture up on, uh, you can see, is one bullfrog we caught from our pond. And as we got it out, I noticed the stomach was very uh, dis distended and hard. And we dissected it to see what was in it. And you can see there's a baby turtle inside it and a couple crayfish. Um, they're notorious for eating anything that they can fit in their mouth. They found some with muskrat uh, uh, ducklings. Uh, one was found with a small mink inside it uh, in the 70s. So um, yeah, so basically any, and they're larger than all the native frog, all the native leopard frogs. They're a type of leopard frog. They're much larger than the rest of them. So. Um, you get the two of them together and it's just a foregone conclusion who you're gonna end up with in, in a matter of a, a few years, you'll have the bullfrogs and that's about it, okay? We put a picture of the native, one of the native toads there, the Woodhouse's toads. And, you, and those seem to hold their own against the bullfrog because they're mildly toxic. And I've heard that bullfrogs will let you spit them out. So the, bull, the toads can hang in, hang in on their own. And then you can look at the tadpoles. Do you guys ever see tadpoles in an in a irrigation canal or a pond? The bullfrog tadpoles are just Godzilla-sized tadpoles. They're much, much larger than the rest. You see the two there. The one is a bullfrog tadpole that's only a year old. And then the second pit, the one next to it is a bullfrog tadpole about to change. And that's two years. So they're the only uh, amphibian in the state that stays as a tadpole for longer than a year. And they're, they're about the size of a golf ball with a tail. I mean, you look at that picture, the scale, it's about six inches long. It's far and away larger than any of the natives. So invasive species aren't just funny looking amphibians. They come in all different forms, including birds. And it's interesting, um, the European starling, if you just look at the feathers, it's, it's a gorgeous bird. Look at the iridescent colors. 
even the Audubon Society is not a fan of the European starling. And they proclaim that it's one of the most destructive to native wildlife because of um, pushing out native cavity nesters um, and damaging crops, et cetera. Um, and the house sparrow isn't much better, but uh, I understand you can make a, a lovely starling pate. And my husband actually put a recipe in your cookbook for that. I love that quote. <laughs> Oh yeah, I should read the quote. Uh, this is from the Audubon. Everyone's got something they love to hate. For some, it's Justin Bieber. For others, it's the New York Yankees. For birders, it's the European starling. Invasive species can be mammals too, um, including the feral hog. Uh, we do have a native javelina. That's the one in the picture on the lower left. Uh, they look quite a bit different. Pavelina doesn't have a tail. So if you do go out hunting uh, for a feral hog, don't get the javelina. Um, and the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish uh, finds the feral hog so destructive that they anybody can hunt the species without a license. It, in state, out of state, doesn't matter. And if you do have a smoker at home, they might make some delicious bacon, feral hog bacon. And invasive species can be fish. Luckily for us, we do not have Asian carp in New Mexico yet, right? But it is uh, a priority class one species, which means that it does have a high potential to invade our waters. Uh, invasive fish can be voracious and they outcompete native fish and they cause a lot of economic hardship. And, you know, hopefully it will never will get here. But if it does, we have a recipe for Asian tacos, Asian carp tacos that'll keep it at bay. And then something as innocuous seeming as your goldfish can be really, really invasive. So um, that picture there is one of three uh, koi which I, I believe a goldfish is a species of koi, um, that were, again, probably with the best of intentions, somebody thought, everybody thinks uh, our pond is like a, an orphanage for animals they don't want. And it's really frustrating sometimes. So I just uh, came to school one day and noticed the three very large gold shiny fish in the pond. And again, um, if you've ever had goldfish, they breed like rabbits. Um, and uh, I knew if I didn't get them out right away, then that's all we'd have is goldfish. And of course they take resources, they take space, which means they take those away from the native fish that we were trying to get established, like a uh, fathead minnow and catfish and, and mosquito fish. So very luckily I was able to catch all three of them pretty quickly. But um, if you guys have heard of, uh, there's a, a nice little lake down south called, by a town called uh, Kamado, the Kamado Lake. And I think about 10, 15 years ago, they basically had to drain the entire lake. And this is, I mean, not a pond, this is a lake. It took years to drain out because the goldfish were so bad in there. Um, that was the only, uh, only realistic solution was to do something that drastic. They drained the entire lake and refilled it. And again, all it's going to take, sadly, is somebody with, again, probably the best intentions to think, you know, Captain the shiny, shiny sides, their pet goldfish would really like it out there and then dump it in. And so this is where education is really the key. It, um, people have great intentions. They just don't know. You know, they don't know the damage that's done. They just think any animal, any plant can grow anywhere. And that's part of nature. And that's wonderful. And it's not sometimes. And last but not least, invasive species can be plants. And in fact, there are a lot, a lot of invasive plant species, and many of which are edible, including our friend, the dandelion. You may know the dandelion as a pesky lawn weed, but it also can invade natural areas. Uh, just a few weekends ago, I was up in the San Pedro Parks Wilderness area with my, my family, and it, we found multiple places where it was 100% dandelion cover. Um, so it is a problem, but luckily um, it is also quite nutritious. Uh, one, one of the more nutritious plants you can eat and it makes a, a nice quiche. You can make quiche from it and there's a recipe in your cookbook for dandelion spanakopita. So uh, in your um, centerpiece you have uh, samples of three of the big four invasive trees in the state. Um, 
interesting to note we should say is that most invasive species um, are one of the reasons they're successful is because they come from other parts of the world that have very similar climates to New Mexico. So for example, you can dump all the bananas you want out in the mesa, they're not going to take here because they can't handle the cold. So we're, you know, coconuts aren't going to be invasive, polar bears aren't going to be invasive here. So all four of these come from basically the same latitude over in Asia, uh, um, a lot, most of them in China, I believe. So we have a uh, Siberian elm, we have a uh, Russian salt cedar, Russian olive, and then the fourth one is actually serendipitously right here, and that is um, Atlantis or Tree of Heaven, uh, which is all 50 states now, right? And all of them come from about the same latitude as, uh, oh, is this one here? Is it? Yeah, yeah, that's, the, and that's the reason it's not in your centerpiece is because Atlantis is not, it, it's pretty toxic. So we didn't want to have that right in front of you when you're eating. Um, Russian olive, uh, the olives are edible. Um, we had a hard time trying to find a recipe for them, but you can, I, I, I can see them. You can kind of nibble on them and they're a little, they're a little sweet. Um, the elms we already talked about, you can eat the seeds when they're young and fresh still. When they, when they start to fall off, they're, they're too papery, it's not very tasty. And this tamarisk, kind of, this is kind of a mystery to us. We were researching this, and it says they make a, a, a honey sweet manna. And um, we try to find out what manna is. And we look, I was researching it on Google last night. And yeah, obviously, from, from biblical times, it seems to be either from a, a, a scale insect that infects them and, and exudes this. We don't know what it is. <laughs> so hopefully, we do this again next year. We have some some salt cedar manna for you, whatever that stuff is. Yeah, here's the other uh, kind of con convoluted problem with, with uh, invasives is sometimes the natives like them. With Russian olive, for example, there's a there's an endangered uh, bird called the little flycatcher that seems to prefer making, oh, is it tamarisk too? Okay, oh, is it tamarisk? I'm sorry. So it's tamarisk, they, they <laughs> seem to prefer making their nests in that. So that kind of provide, gives a conservation biologist a catch 22 they get rid of the tamarisk and they're destroying a habitat that this endangered bird wants. And so it's, uh, it's, it's tricky. Management is very tricky. Russian olive was brought, I believe on purpose by the uh, Bureau of Reclamation, I believe, to uh, help stabilize banks, I think in Albuquerque. I know um, salt cedar, or I'm sorry, Russian olive was, or sorry, I get them all confused. Uh, Siberian elm was brought, I believe the story I heard was by Mayor Popejoy in Albuquerque to provide shade back in the day. Um, so again, these things were a lot of these mistakes happen when we just didn't know about this stuff. We didn't understand the, the intricacies of, of ecology uh, back then. So they thought, you know, this is a good, uh, a Zarek uh, desert, to you know, tolerant tree. It's the desert here. Why not bring it over? These things help to stabilize banks. That's what the problem we need to solve. Let's just bring them over. And they didn't think too far ahead. And then once they're here, it's really, 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 really hard to get rid of them. I mean, imagine trying to cut down every Russian olive in New Mexico pretty impossible. This was one, this last picture, is this the last picture? Or last picture of a, of a species. Um, again, I came to school one day and I'm sure again, somebody with the best of intentions had thrown over our fence into the pond, all this water hyacinth, very pretty plant, um, highly invasive. I don't know if it's really taken over New Mexico yet, but there are parts of, of the country where water hyacinth is a huge problem. And again, they float. So luckily I was able to scoop them all out, but they are actually edible too. Um, we don't have those today. And salsify, you've probably seen in your neighborhood, right? And um, in the spring, I believe you can pull them out in their root. You can kind of chop it up and kind of saute it. I think now it's a little too rough. I think we tried yeah, and right. they were very woody. Yeah, so. So we should probably think about joining these goats. Um, just last week, uh, KOB News did a story on um, goats being used to control some of the same species we're talking about today, Russian olive and salt cedar in the Corrales Bosque. And so the goats are doing eradication by mastication. Uh, we should too. And, um, and the goats were more than happy to oblige. So before you go off and start um, doing some wild harvesting of invasive species, we have a couple tips for you. First of all, uh, make sure you can properly identify the species that you're after. Um, you don't want to inadvertently collect a native species, and you certainly don't want to collect a species that is toxic. Um, also, even if you're collecting on public land or private land, be sure you get permission first. You might need a permit. Um, 
also, you want to make sure you um, time it to when the, the right season is. For uh, the Siberian elm, there's only like a two week period where you can get the seeds. Uh, but bullfrog, I mean, I think the season goes from May all the way to October. So uh, just get to know your species. And also you wanna know what parts of the plant or animal are edible. Um, in the case of the salsify, which Jason just mentioned, um, if you went out and harvested a bunch of leaves, you'd be pretty disappointed because it's actually the roots that are edible. And anytime you're experimenting with new foods, it's good to just do it in small quantities so that you, you know, make sure you don't have any sensitivities. Uh, so to wrap this up, um, this is one of my favorite quotes from, you know, probably the most famous conservationist in this country ever, Aldo Leopold. And the quote is, uh, one of the penalties of an environmental education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Uh, I was sitting in a restaurant a few years ago with my family and I was, while we were waiting for our food to be brought out, I was listening to this uh, two ladies in the booth next to me talking about this wonderful tree that just started to grow in their yard and it was just so beautiful and amazing and she didn't have to water it. And as I'm listening to her describe it, it was, it was a Russian olive. And they are very pretty and they do grow wonderful and you don't have to take much care of them. And I knew, you know, I can't go over there and, you know, butt into their conversation, explain to her why they're bad because it, people don't want to hear that. Uh, so it's tricky, you know, when you, when you understand the damage that invasives do, you're one of the few people that do. And so driving through a field of, uh, or a Siberian elm woodlot, you know, everybody else may think, oh, what a pretty little patch of forest. You see it for what it is. You see it for like, it's a sign of damage an invasion. Um, so it can be hard, you know, I think that the, the best hope we have with this is, is education. Um, is, and um, that's why, again, as a teacher, one of my fellow teachers is right there, um, we do our best to, to, to uh, get our t students to understand why this is such a problem and the steps they can do to help alleviate it, one of which I think one of the more creative and innovative ways is to eat them. So it's, this is such a neat project to be involved in. So. That's it. Thank you very much. We do have a prize. So we already have a question from the live stream, which is they're curious about the um, the cookbook and they're wondering how they can how people who are not here in person can get a cookbook. If you go to our website um, with the Institute for Applied Ecology, um, you can um, go to our store and you can purchase a cookbook from our store. It's $25 and we will send it right to you. Um, if anyone here would like to buy a cookbook, um, we could just call in your credit card or however you wanna do it. Oh, and by the way, um, I hope you keep asking questions because we have a prize for the best question, one of these nice aprons. So please ask some good questions. So are there any more questions from people who are here in person or on the live stream? Okay. Oh, we do have a question. I have bees and I'm always looking for flowering plants and I found um, a field of thistle when I was traveling a couple months ago and I harvested a bunch of seeds. Is it a bad idea to plant those? That is a great question. Um, we, um, thistle is a very popular plant among pollinators. And we do have a lot of native thistle here in New Mexico. Circium neomexicana is a lovely thistle. Um, I don't know which one you have in your yard, but um, if you like thistle, which I like quite a bit, and it's um, one I'd love to see in more yards, um, uh, Circium neomexicana. Um, it's got a beautiful blue foliage. Um, so yes, I'd say if it's an invasive species, I wouldn't promote it. Um, oh, yeah, I don't know if we have a lot of musk thistle. That might be uh, maybe a bull thistle or Canada thistle. There's a lot of thistles. <laughs> yeah, if you go to the Native Plant Society of New Mexico's website, they have a page 
that's it has a little it's really user friendly and it's it's like a little key to the the, the thistles you can find and it'll tell you if they're native or not so if you have one in hand and you go to that website within like five minutes it'll, you'll be able to find out it's uh, the native plant society of new mexico their website and there's actually a whole book on the thistles of new mexico produced by bob savinsky um, and i think you can also find that on uh, the native plant society website My question is about the best way to eradicate what I call the stinkweed. Anyway, well, so I just pull it out, but is there some better way? Yeah, it's it's challenging because one of the reasons it is so successful as an invasive is when you cut it down, as I'm sure you've noticed, it, it resprouts. Um, it makes it lots of yeah, it's it's tough. Um, I would say without resorting to uh, herbicides, the best thing to do is just stay on it, is pull it out and just like really be consistent. Like every couple of days when you see a shoot, pull it out, it'll eventually run out of energy. I mean, it may take a year or more, but if you're really, if you're persistent, you'll win. But um, yeah, they're they're tricky. They're, it, you can't really pull them out. And again, you can't cut them, well, you can cut them down, but you just gotta, st you gotta keep at it. I've heard some groups that there's a kind of a, debate going on with some conservation groups about the efficacy of using a, a roundup on it they say maybe it, it, it outweighs I, I don't know i don't want to get into that but um yeah just keep just keep pulling it keep pulling it keep pulling it and you'll win one day and that's the trick right except you can be all about this and then your neighbor's not it's it's really hard yeah i i, I feel you trust me it's, it's hard just keep fighting the good fight you know So there's a question from our live stream about um, how to cook Siberian pesto. Um, do, do any of you have any tips about that? I've never tried that before. Maybe. Louis, do you want to just talk about some pesto cooking? We would use the seeds, so I'm not sure if um, the seeds, do they have sort of a nutty taste? I wonder if they would be a replacement for the pine nuts. Um, and so you might use basil, maybe throw in a little dandelion, and, um, and then maybe the nuttiness can come from the seeds. That's my guess. Great, thank you. Another question. How do you gauge invasive as a term? Because there, you can plant certain plants that aren't native. Like we planted a um, small Japanese maple tree. I don't really see it as invasive. It doesn't uh, reproduce in that way from what I can tell, but it's not native here. I mean, do you encourage uh, just doing native plants, or is there a series of of plants from around the world that can be shared around the world? That's another good question. And you know, just because a plant isn't native uh, does not mean that it's going to be an invasive species. Invasive species usually have those characteristics that I mentioned, where they you know, literally take over and they cause serious disruption to ecosystems. And so I don't think a maple in your yard is um, qualifies as an invasive species. Um, there's a lot of non-native species that we can live in peace with in our yards and, um, and it's not a problem. When we're doing habitat restoration, uh, we do intentionally use only native species, but there are a lot of values to having um, species from other places. Think about grapes. Where would we be without grapes? And um, so there's in agriculture, we obviously are growing a lot of species that aren't native. Um, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, it's, it's that potential for them to escape, as they say, cultivation. If the, if the non-native plant can get out of your yard on its own and take care of itself on its own, that's when it has the potential to become invasive. And most things in your yard are not like Norway maples and Japanese maples and stuff like that aren't invasive because of that. 
Yeah. So if you, you know, you have every right to have any kind of, you know, to have a wide variety of non-natives in your yard is just the ones that do have that. There's one, one example I can think of recently was it's really common ornamental shrub called bird of paradise. It's a really beautiful flower. It's from Argentina, I believe, which is about the same distance south of the equator as we are north. So it is kind of pre-adapted and that has started to escape cultivation. And there are areas, especially in the southern part of the state where it's really starting to take over. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's basically do your homework is the best thing you can do to avoid that. Yeah. And I think people underestimate how invasive butterfly bush can be. It's, we love butterfly bush. It attracts all kinds of pollinators. It's really pretty, but it, it can be invasive in some situations. Okay, hey, we have one more question over here. <laughs> Um, is there a good like resource that you would recommend for um, uh, nutritional benefits of in different invasive plants? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I usually just do web queries to to find out more about those. Uh, maybe Jason has some more. Do you have any more information about no, nutritional like value? Yeah, I usually just search the web. It's loaded with information. Just make sure that they know what they're talking about. <laughs> okay, are there any more questions? Well, um, our videographer is going to be the one to uh, select the winner of the um, of the contest to win one of these aprons. Um, so if our videographer might step around and introduce himself. <laughs> hi, hi. Thank you. Uh, my name's Andy. And uh, I was really psyched uh, to hear questions from online and get to interact that way. But I got to give it to the question about the thistle. Thank you, Andy, and um, thanks again to all of you who are here in person and all of you who are live streaming this presentation. And of course, thanks so much to Melanie and Jason and to Lewis um, for teaming up with Site Santa Fe on our Digest This program. Um, our next Digest This program is next Saturday at Sazon. Um, Chef Fernando will be taking us on a tour through Mole. Um, please join us uh, Saturday the 26th, I believe is the date. That's noon as well. Um, but also um, feel free to live stream that one. And um, look forward to seeing you guys in a week. Thanks again for being here today. <laughs>